Who in here is planning to watch the Super Bowl this weekend? Anybody like on purpose ignoring it because you just straight up don't care? I respect your commitment to the bit. Yep, good work. Um, lots of other fun sports news happened like yesterday. If you're a basketball fan, LeBron James just became the NBA's all-time leading scorer, which is crazy. Like, I know. They stopped the game in the middle of the third quarter to do a whole ceremony uh, to celebrate LeBron. That was, that was kind of crazy. Um, what other sports do you guys play? Soccer fans? Volleyball? Volleyball? Softball? Basketball? Snow? Snowball? Soccer, yeah. I want to um, I wanna start off my message tonight actually with a video clip from a show that's sort of about soccer. So, Abigail, we're going to need sound. Make sure we have sound on the, uh, the computer because this is a clip from a TV show called Ted Lasso, which is like sort of about soccer. Uh, that's gonna, it's going to play into uh, my message for tonight. So it's about a minute. It's about a minute, but I want, I want you to, to watch... Watch this conversation really quick. There's just one complication now. Manchester City have called, and they've inquired about terminating Jamie's loan. They're going to take his house? No, Ted. Jamie's contract is owned by Manchester City, and they, in turn, loaned him to Richmond for the season. Oh, OK. I get it. They want Jamie back if you are planning to bench him. I'm not planning on that. No, my plan is for my plan to work. But you know what they say about the best laid plans, right? Hmm. Said plan too many times. Words lost all its meaning now. Plan, plan, plan. No matter. Hey, you tell Man City that this man has a plan. Plan, 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 plan. plan. No, not plan. 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 Like flan. Plan. Flan. That dessert. Yes, like flan. Yeah. No, I, I don't dig on flan. Plan. 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 plan? Word become a sound. What's that called again? Semantic satiation. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so try it. So pick, pick like any word, like, I don't know, microphone, and just like repeat it to yourself for like 15 seconds. Like microphone, 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 microphone. microphone. Starts to sound really weird. It's like not even a word anymore. Did you, did you hear what that was called? Semantic satiation, big words, semantic satiation. Basically, it's this weird phenomenon. Guys in the back, shh, scoot forward. I don't trust you to sit that far away, making too much noise. Like, if you repeat a word over and over and over and over again, like, psychologically, your brain starts to, like, disassociate that word from its meaning and all of a sudden you're just like uttering syllables and sounds your brain isn't even picking up on the fact that you're saying a real word anymore like when Ted Lasso kept saying plan 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 it just sort of just sort of loses all of its meaning I think I think that happens to really important words too words like love Words like hate, words that should be incredibly powerful but lose their meaning because we say them so much. I love dogs. I love ice cream. I love football. I love you. I love God. I hate spiders. I hate losing. I hate asparagus. I hate you. In our cultural climate, hey, track with me now. Track with me now. Shh. In our cultural climate, we've basically decided that the word love is for anything that we feel even remotely positive about, and the word hate is for anything that we feel the slightest bit negative about. It's like semantic satiation. John Tyson, who, who wrote a book called Beautiful Resistance that I have based this whole series on, he said this in his, in his book. He said, I am more concerned about the manipulation of our hearts on a daily basis through cultural forces. This whole series is about this cultural pull. 
and in this instance, towards devaluing words like love and hate. Because when we've devalued these words, they've lost their meaning. Hatred becomes easier. And if hatred is easy, that means our hearts are being manipulated. We have to have a counter-cultural way to combat hate. And love has always been that way. The way of Jesus is the way of love. Especially love for those that we would call our enemies. Those who it might be easiest for us to hate. So the title of my message and the big idea are once again, just like last week, the same statement. This week, love must resist hate. If you're a note taker, write that at the top of your page. Love must resist hate. Tonight, we're going to be looking at some of Jesus' most famous words. Words that are easy to hear, but really hard to live out. We'll be in Luke's gospel in chapter 6, so you can go ahead and start making your way there. If you don't have a Bible and you want a Bible in front of you, there's a stack of them on the table in the back of the room. Now would be your time to stand up, go get one. If you've got the Bible app on your phone and you can like trust yourself and I can trust you to be on the Bible app and not on something else, then you can do it. Really, Lucas? Lucas just shows his phone to me to prove that he's on the Bible app, and it's clearly a game. Oh, okay, okay, whatever. Uh Uh-huh, right? If you're going to be on your phone on the Bible app, be on the Bible app. But if you're like, no, I know there's distractions, then put your phone on the ground and don't touch it. Luke 6, we're going to be starting in verse 27. Okay. Luke 6, starting in verse 27. Okay. In order for us to get just how countercultural the way of Jesus really is, we have to remember what his day looked like, which means it is time for a super quick world history lesson with Pastor Danny. Are you ready? Buckle up. This is going to be quick. We're going to cover a couple thousand years of history in a couple of seconds. Prepare yourselves. Ready, set, Go. Last week in the book of Numbers, Israel had just been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, but God leads them out of slavery and onto the, the brink of the promised land. But Israel, they didn't trust God. They didn't want to enter the promised land like God had instructed to them, so they had to go wander in the desert for 40 years until everybody who was a part of that generation died. But then Joshua got to lead them into the promised land, and they took over the promised land that God had given them, and they set up a system of government called Well, really, the judges, they had these people who were in charge making decisions for them. We've got a book of the Bible called Judges talking about their story. But then eventually, Israel decided they wanted a king just like all of the countries around them. So they found this guy named Saul. He was big. He was strong. He was a mighty warrior. And so they made Saul king. This is about a thousand years before Jesus is born. After Saul, we get King David. King David's a great king. He expands the borders of Israel. He follows God. The Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. And after King David, we get David's son Solomon. And under Solomon's rule, Israel becomes as big as it will ever be, almost like a regional power in the land. But after Solomon, things go downhill really, really quick. There's a civil war. The kingdom, it splits into two. There's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And because they're no longer united, they become easy prey for all the enemies, the empires who are surrounding them. So in 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire comes knocking on the door of the northern kingdom, destroys the northern kingdom, and deports all of the people into exile. Those people will never again see their homes. They will never return to Israel, to the promised land. But the southern kingdom, they hold out just a little bit longer, like a couple hundred years longer. And in 587 B.C., the Babylonian Empire comes to the kingdom of Judah. They knock on the door. They destroy everything. They take all the people and deport them into exile in Babylon. That's where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that all takes place. But Babylon had a king named Cyrus. And Cyrus, 
he was kind of a smart guy. He wanted the people to think well of him. So he actually said, hey, all of you Israelites in captivity in Babylon, you can go home. You can rebuild Jerusalem. You can rebuild your temple. You're still going to be under my authority, but at least you'll be home. And so he says, hey, go back to Israel. A couple hundred years later, one of the greatest world rulers in the history of our planet, Alexander the Great and the Macedonian Empire, conquers most of the known world from Greece to India, most of Egypt. The empire spans far and wide, including Israel. And so we have power after power after power oppressing Israel. First Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, now these Greeks... And so Israel decides to fight back. And around 134 BC, there's a revolt. And it's a a group of people called the Maccabees. And they fight for their independence and the freedom of Israel. And they finally achieve it. And there's a brief period, about 100 years, where Israel is once again an independent nation. But about 30 years before Jesus is born, The new kids on the block, the Roman Empire, comes and sweeps through the entire world, establishing an empire even bigger than Alexander's, and takes over Israel once again. So think about the stage that Jesus has been born into, the cultural climate happening in his day. Nation after nation, empire after empire, has oppressed, enslaved, exiled God's people. And they are mad about it. They're desperately waiting for somebody who's going to save them from this Roman Empire. That person they call a Messiah, a Savior. And they want this person to be a military ruler who can, who can cast off the chains of oppression and free them as a country once again. And we know that this promised Messiah is Jesus. And so listen to what John Tyson has to say about Jesus. He says, people must have been dumbfounded. Jesus was building a movement and amassing followers, but instead of calling them to violent revolution, he was calling them to enemy love. Countercultural. So that's where we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 6. So if you've got a Bible, turn there. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be on the screens. But I want you to have the Bible in front of you if you can. That's why they're in the back of the room. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 27. Everybody there? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 27, my Bible says this, But you, who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. Love must resist hate. My message tonight is only one point, so it's going to be short. It's going to be memorable. So if you're a note taker, write this down. Love looks different 
than you think. Love looks different than you think. The whole point of Jesus' teaching on love in this passage is that it looks different than you think that it would. It's counter-cultural. It's a form of resisting the pull that this world has on your soul. When, when Jesus' listeners would have first heard him start teaching on love, they would have remembered right away one of the key commandments in the Old Testament found in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18. Don't seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. I also learned this from John Tyson's book, that that the Jewish rabbis, their, their teachers of the Bible back in the day, they had interpreted this verse to mean, love your Jewish neighbor only. Love people who are just like you are only. But Jesus, he, he turns this teaching like completely upside down. Don't just love people who are like you. Don't just love people who treat you well. Don't just love people who love you. Jesus goes so far as to command you to love your enemies. The ones who aren't like you. The ones who have hurt you. The ones who don't love you. The ones who hate you you, the ones who it would be really easy for you to hate. In Luke 6, Jesus gives this example. If somebody slaps you across the face, like offer the other cheek to them too. You see, in the ancient world, like a backhanded slap across the face was the biggest insult that you could possibly give to somebody else, like to the point where there were actually laws against it in some countries. Because think about it, it's not like a punch that's trying to do damage. That slap across the face, its only purpose is to dishonor someone. To show them contempt, which we talked about last week. As a follower of Jesus, we don't return insult for insult, dishonor for dishonor, contempt for contempt. We live different, we move different. And then Jesus gives another example. He says that if if somebody demands your coat, give them your shirt along with it. You see, the poorest people in Jesus' day, they might only have one coat. They might only have one shirt. And so, basically, if you lose both your coat and your shirt, you're, you're, you're walking around basically naked at that point. You see, Jesus, he's speaking in hyperbole. He's He's exaggerating. Because he doesn't want you to like walk around naked, but he is saying this, that even if somebody were to do everything that they could to make themselves your enemy, even taking all of your stuff, love even that person too. Love resists hate. I love this quote that I found from from an author named Preston Sprinkle. It's one of the funniest names I've ever seen, but he says this, The one who loves his enemies can no longer have enemies. He's left with only neighbors. But since we're talking about love so much, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and we actually understand what love is and what love is not. Because after all, love looks different than you think. Hollywood has been selling us a love story for our entire lives, right? It's in every movie, it's in every TV show, the same form of like romantic love. It's led to a distorted view of what love is. It's led to that semantic satiation where we say love over and over and over again and it basically just doesn't mean anything anymore, In Hollywood, it's all romantic love. It's all being in love with someone. It's all super emotional high highs and low lows. We fight and we break up and we get back together sort of love. It's all based on how you feel, like you fall into love and then you fall out of love. But that's not love. Love has a feeling component to it, but it's not only that. C.S. Lewis had a good quote, and you know it wouldn't be a Danny sermon if I wasn't quoting C.S. Lewis. But he says, love, in the Christian sense, 
doesn't mean an emotion. It's a state not of the feelings, but of the will. The state of the will which we have naturally about ourselves, but we must learn to have about other people. In other words, he's saying, love is a choice. Love is a choice about how you're going to treat someone. Love is a choice about how you're going to see someone. You will never naturally love your enemies. You have to choose to do it. It's not easy. And Jesus never said that it would be. If we go back to Luke 6, look look at what Jesus says. Why should you get credit for doing the easy thing? Loving those who love you, easy. Doing good back to people who do good to you, that's easy. Treating people well who treat you well, that's easy. Why should you get credit for doing the easy thing? If you're going to follow Jesus, he is going to ask you to do stuff that is really hard. Like loving your enemies. Like resisting this cultural tug to hate other people. Loving your enemies, it's a really easy thing to talk about, but it's really, really hard to do. In this passage, Jesus, he gives like one tangible way that we should practice loving our enemies. And he says, lending them money without expecting repayment. For Jesus' listeners, that would have been unthinkable, unheard of. And you can even imagine today how kind of crazy that that sounds, right? We're all about money in our culture. To think about giving somebody a loan and not even at, like expecting that they would repay it, like sounds crazy. But maybe someday when you have your own job and you're making your own money, you can be radically generous like that and love people in that way. But I don't think that applies super well to your life as a sixth grader, a seventh grader, or an eighth grader right now. So let's try and bring this home a little bit. Uh, make it a little bit more practical for your season of life. Um, I brought something with me. No, it's not a purse. What are these? They are, they're not goggles. They're binoculars. Binoculars. What do binoculars do? Right. They help you see things that are far away. They magnify right? They give the appearance that something that, tr- that is in reality far away from you is actually pretty close to you. So like if I were to put these on, check in on the dudes in the back, see that they're uh, in fact not paying attention to my message, but uh, are tagging one another on their phones. Yep, I can see you. Hi, Brooks. Good to see you. Right? Even though they're far away from me, it appears as though they are close. Hey, ladies. Three. Did I get it right? Nice. Right? So binoculars, they take something that is in reality far away, but make you think and appear that it is close to you. Here's what I see you guys do pretty often. All right. Over there is a person that I don't like very much. So I'm just going to get my, my love binoculars out, and I'm just going to, uh-huh, there they are, that person who I do not like, who does not like me, but I know that Jesus has told me that I'm supposed to love them, so I am going to love them. That's what I'm doing. I, yep, I love them. That's, that's what I'm doing. No, I'm looking way over there. You pretend that you're actually close to that person because love demands that you actually get close to them. You can't actually love somebody from a distance. You can't love someone by looking at them through binoculars and making it appear as though you're near them. You've actually got to get near them. And the good thing is that's actually really easy for you to do because the people that God is telling you to love, the people who's even coming to your brains right now as I say the word enemy, they're probably in your class. They're probably in your neighborhood. They're probably on your sports team. They might actually even be in this room. We're not called to look at them through binoculars. We're called to actually 
love them, to get close to them, to really live out the type of enemy love that Jesus talks about, you have to interact with them. And I'm going to pause really quick. What is happening? Malachi, sit please. Thank you. Don't know. Shh, focus up. Focus, please. Shh. To really live out the type of enemy love that Jesus requires of us, you have to interact. And loving them, it's probably not going to be you lending them money. Right? For a 6th grader, 7th grader, 8th grader, I don't think that's how you're going to end up loving this person. But it might mean serving them in some way, even though it's hard to serve them. It might be encouraging them in some way, even though it's hard to encourage them. It might mean inviting them into something, even though you think that they're going to say no. It might mean praying for them, and, and actually like really praying for them. Not that type of prayer that's basically gossip but actually praying for them. It might mean sharing the gospel with them, finding out what their faith tradition is, and, and sharing Jesus with them. It might mean sitting down at a lunch table and say, hey, you and I, we have not really gotten off on the right foot, but could we start over? It might mean going out of your way to be nice to them. And when they ask you, why are you being so nice to me? You just say, hey, I just want to love you the way that Jesus loves you. Like there are very practical ways that you can start to love people that it might be really hard for you to love. None of those things are easy, but Jesus isn't asking you to do something easy. Jesus is asking you to love when the pull from the culture says that you should hate them instead. When we see our enemies as actual people that we're called to love, the word love takes on the fullness of its meaning. We get away from that semantic satiation. And when we think about trying to love someone who we are tempted to hate, that it can feel overwhelming, like it's too hard, impossible even. So let me remind you of the truth of the gospel. You see, we are only capable of love because Christ first loved us. In 1 John chapter 4, it says that we love each other because he loved us first. And how did God prove to you that he loves you? While you were his enemy, he loved you. Romans chapter 5 says this, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, we will, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son when we were his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. And did we do anything to deserve that type of love? No. Another C.S. Lewis quote, he says that, that Christ didn't die for us because we were intrinsically worth dying for, but because he is intrinsically love and therefore loves infinitely. God loves you so much that he was willing to have his son die for you so that you could be free from the chains of your sin so that you could be free from that haunting feeling of shame, that you could be free from the power of our culture and the power of our enemy, the devil. And so now what? Colossians chapter 1 says this. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. 
You have been made right with God because of Jesus. You can have a relationship with God because of Jesus. You can stand before God because of Jesus. That, my friends, is the good news of the gospel. That's why you can follow Jesus into hard things like loving your enemies because you were God's enemy and he loved you first. That is why love must resist hate. So let me just close by praying, and then we're going to jump into our soap for this evening. I'll explain that if you haven't been around for the last few weeks, but join me in prayer as we, as we close out this message. Jesus, we can't even begin to thank you enough for the fact that you loved us even though we were your enemies. And Jesus, now that you have called us to do the same, to go love our enemies, we know that we can only do it because your spirit lives within us. So I thank you, Jesus, for the good news of the gospel. And Lord, if there is a student in here who doesn't know you, who doesn't know that good news, Lord, would you bring them to yourself even tonight? I believe that you're that powerful, Jesus. You can do that. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you that it's true. Thank you that it is the rule for our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen.